This morning, I have the absolute pleasure and privilege of introducing one of the greatest people I've ever met who has been a pal for many years, but it's also, other than that, um, discipleship um, pastor at St. Church in Hackney in London. Uh, St. Church is also part of the network that we are part of at HCV, um, and she's all around just wonderfully wise human being. Um, can we give a massive round of applause as I welcome Nye Maxwell to the stage? Yay! Wonderful. Um, would you like me to pray? Should we do that so that it's... Let's do that. I'm just going to... There you go. Whoopsie. Sorry. I'm now. There we go. Let's go. Um, Father God, we thank you so much for now. We thank you so much um, for what she's prepared to be sharing with us today. Um, and Father, we just thank you for how you walk with her and how she shares um, who you are daily. And we pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Well, hi guys. Um, as Lucy said, my name is Nye and I work in a wonderfully exotic place called Acne. <laughs> and I love East London. I once Googled it. You know, you kind of like, you've got time on your hands and you're like, let me just look up what it says about the place I live. The hits were kind of depressing. It was like, why is Hackney so dangerous? Um, why is Hackney even popular? Which I took personal offense to. Um, and then there were like some really depressing stuff on like youth violence. And I was like, no, 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 there is more to Hackney than like headlines and slightly unnecessary hipsters. Like I swear there's so much more going on to the place that I love and get to call home. And I really do love living in Hackney. I love catching vans with school kids at the end of the day. I love that we get to do primary schools in our um, primary school assemblies. I love that I actually know my neighbours because East London is like this weird little quirky place that feels like a village in a really big city. But with all of that, I love East London because it is home. Because in the 1960s, my grandparents came over from the West Indies and settled about five minutes away from where I live now. They even got married in 1963 at the church which I would become ordained to 60 years later. East London is in our family and God has just been doing a really wild thing that for whatever reason he's allowed us to have a part in. And so it makes me really excited to be there. I talk about it all the time. My friends act like I'm married to Hackney. But I swear, if you ever come and visit, you will see why. We're a really quirky bunch, but like, there's a good heart. It's just inside some mildly rough packaging. Well, today I've been asked to speak on peace as you continue the series on a people of love, joy, and peace. And I wonder what word comes to mind when you hear that, what ideas you think of. Perhaps there are times where you've experienced a deep sense of peace, or maybe there are causes or places that are on your heart that you pray would know peace. If I'm absolutely honest, when I think of the word peace, I think of the kids' actions to my lighthouse. You know, like, you are the peace of our travesty. Just, do you guys not do family worship here? <laughs> we love it. If you want an action perfect like rendition of my lighthouse, come find me afterwards. I'm available for like birthday parties, discos, I've got you. When it comes to peace, it's one of those things that I don't really think about until I realize I'm missing it or until I recognize other people or places that are in need of it. I know what peace looks like because I know what war looks like. I understand peace because conflict exists, because everyone experiences negative things like fear or worry. What I do know is that peace is priceless. It's the calm amidst the storm. It's the tool in your arsenal that brings things back into perspective. And so today, I want to encourage you to simply draw near to the Prince of Peace so that you would reflect him and his kingdom to the world around you. In a moment, we're going to get into our passage, but I'm so grateful that Jesus doesn't just talk about peace in the Gospels. He doesn't even just show it as he calms the storm, but he gives us his peace. And as we unpack the word of God together, as we make room for the Spirit to equip and empower us, why don't we give our hearts to the God who desires to give us his peace? So why don't we pray, and then I'll read the passage. God, I thank you that you come to us, Lord, that you open our hearts and you give us your peace. 
I thank you that you care enough about the things we are facing or experiencing, that you want to speak truth to those anxieties and those wounds. Thank you that you are a God of healing and of hope. And as we reflect on your word, would we leave this place encouraged that you have peace for us, a peace that cannot be stolen, that cannot be robbed. We pray your blessing over us, over our hearts and our minds, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, today's reading is taken from John 14, verses 23 to 27. Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Amen. Amen. Well, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Peace is a promise when we live in step with God's ways. And we know it to be true because all too often we experience the opposite. When we try and strive for things in our own strength, or when we make choices that are not good for us, the first thing we experience is that loss of peace. We get more stressed. Our thoughts get tied up in knots. We worry about people liking us or judging us or questioning whether we're good enough. If you've been doing things that are not helping you, that are not good for you, turn away from them. If you're caught in habits that make you hide or feel ashamed, ask for God's help to quit them. If anxious thoughts seem to pop up at any given moment, share them with a community that can speak truth to the lies and pray for you to know God's wholeness again. In all things, turn towards a God who in love longs to see you fully alive and knows that the way to do so is to walk in step with him. God desires us to know his peace. That much is clear. The passage that I read follows the Last Supper. In the moment where Jesus could have been thinking about himself, about the cross, about fear, about worry, he was trying to reassure the disciples who did not know how to do life without him. In this moment of absolute humility, Jesus sought to bring peace to the very ones who would betray him and let him down. God wants you to know peace and not even denying him or betraying him condemn that desire that he has for you. In fact, he even sends the spirit, the helper, the one who advocates for us to plead on your behalf. And I wish that as Christians, we were somehow exempt from fear or worry. Like we got filled with the spirit like one time and it just did the job for the rest of our lives. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't it just? But it doesn't work like that. Everyone worries about something. If I'm really honest, worry for me has always played itself out in my work. I was that kid who did all-nighters to get through uni. At work, I prided myself on being the last person in the office. If I could show that I was doing enough and giving enough, then maybe I would feel enough. Sometimes work and worry show themselves up in my prayer life. When God hasn't quite answered something where he's not quite delivered on the goods, I start going, can you do this? Are you able? My worry and my fear creep into my spiritual life. We all feel fear at times. Whether we act out of it or we quieten it, it's human nature. And so this isn't a talk to say, hey, if you're feeling worry, it's because you did something wrong. Rather, this is to say, why don't we just get on this stop on the train journey? Why don't we come back to a God who loves to be close to us, who loves to give of himself, who has peace on offer in him? Jesus knew that we would have trouble. That's why he came up with a plan. And you're not alone if you feel worries or fears, if there are anxieties that you hold. The world around us is crying out for peace. You see it when you go on BBC News. You see it when you talk to a friend. There is war and greed and 
conflict and discord, sometimes it's like, where is the peace? As a millennial living in East London, I just have to go outside to see that people are searching for peace. There are hot yoga studios and Reiki's and mindfulness seminars and alternative medicine stalls. In fact, I don't even have to go outside. I just have to go on my phone as influencers in like perfect form-fitting athleisure wear tell me that they alone know the true answer to peace. And it just so happens that you have to like, like and subscribe all of their videos and then you'll find it. It's funny how that works, right? Free advertising. <laughs> Globally, the wellness industry is estimated to be between four to four and a half trillion dollars. People are searching for peace. It's so essential to who we are as humans that they will spend vast sums of money on it, that they'll put their trust in people just as flawed as they are, that they'll change their diet and their medicine and whatever is asked of them. When the truth is that no matter how many products are on the market, peace cannot be manufactured. It cannot be bought. There are things we can do that will make us feel less worried or less burdened, but our efforts can only take us so far. You'll notice in the passage, Jesus says, not as the world gives, do I give. Human peace cannot sustain us, and Jesus knows it. He knows that humans have been trying to make their own way in the world since the dawn of humanity. It's like the one predictable thing about us. But we are not God. We cannot be the solution to the desire that we are craving. True peace is found in God's presence. True peace is a gift that we receive from the Prince of Peace. There's no shortcut. There's no alternative. Peace comes from knowing God and being known by God. And for some of us, that's really annoying. We want to just be given like a checklist on like, do these five things. Someone, somewhere, give me some self-help tips. Tell me how I can do it myself. But peace comes from being open to God, warts and all. It's God's presence to our darkest places that instills a peace so deep it cannot be shaken. It's knowing that God wants to speak to our wounds and our false beliefs that brings peace to the most chaotic soul. I'm a doer, so like, give me an action and I'm good to go. I want there to be strategies and activism, but if I'm doing it out of my woundedness and not my wholeness, I'm just sharing more brokenness in the world. My anger might be righteous, but it is still anger and it is still taking from me. We are called to be a people of peace, a people so filled with God that we leak his presence everywhere. If you've ever read the book of Isaiah, you'll know that it's written to a people living in exile. They've literally been taken from their land. They're under the oppression of someone else. I don't think they're feeling very peaceful. And it's into this context that Isaiah prophesies of a coming Messiah, of one who is going to save them, of one who in his very self is peace. In Isaiah 9, one of the most famous passages in the Bible, he prophesies of a coming ruler whose rule will never end, whose leadership is defined by peace, justice, and righteousness. He says these words, For to us a child is born, to us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. We are called to usher in God's kingdom, to point people to the one who is sovereign and is in control, to the one who renews and restores, who loves justice, righteousness, and truth. And that begins with our own willingness to be vessels of a God who will work in this world through us, not in spite of us. The picture in Isaiah 9 is of the fullness of eternity, this is what heaven will look like. It's what a new creation would look like. But in our present day, Jesus calls us to contend for that right here, right now. And thus we see that Jesus says, if you love him, you will follow him. You'll act like him. And as Christians, we try and live unselfishly. 
We try to let our words be intentional, to be compassionate with those in need, but we don't do it in our strength. We do it in his. It is the spirit within you that allows you to be patient. It's the spirit within you that stirs up uncontainable joy. And it is the spirit helping you to love God and to love others that will enable you to experience deep peace. Jesus knows that this world is broken. And so he doesn't say, hey, everything's going to be perfect from now on. Rather, he says, in this world there will be trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. The truth that grounds our very sense of peace is the knowledge that Jesus is in control. It's the knowledge that even when our inner world or the political climate around us feels chaotic, God is sovereign. God is making a way. And if you've heard those words before, but you're feeling worn out or tired, if you've heard those words before, but you're just in a tough season, come close to God. In a moment or two, we'll have time for ministry and prayer, but God is in the tough places. In Psalm 23, he is present in the valley of the shadow of death. In Psalm 34, he is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. In Psalm 46, he is an ever-present help in times of trouble. God is in the business of tending to us when we are at our most weary and when peace is nothing more than a nice-sounding idea. I was chatting with a young girl yesterday, just shooting the breeze. She's one of those people who have like tons of amazing theological questions for you. They're like, finish Alpha and they're not done. They're not done. They've still got some questions. And so we meet up every now and then. And I kind of have to like gear myself up to be like, what's she going to ask me today? Have I, got, have I got the capacity? Do I know what's happening? But as we were talking, I quickly realized that I was about to be the student as she gave me a lesson on openness and courage. You see, she'd grown up in a really dysfunctional home. She'd been kicked out of school by year nine, kicked out of home three years later. Couch surfing and staying in hostels had led her to a stint in prison. She tried to numb herself to the pain that she felt, the shame that she felt, so she started taking drugs. Really simple, supposed ones at first, but things began to escalate. And in that altered headspace, she'd gotten into things like tarot cards and horoscopes, which always sound trivial until they're not. And in that space, she began to go, I don't know, maybe these things will make me feel better. Maybe they'll give me the answers that I'm craving. Maybe they'll direct me. But they didn't. What they brought her were auditory hallucinations. She began to hear things and hear people who weren't actually there. What they brought her was a paranoia that she could not escape. And people around her just were caught helplessly watching this girl spiral into a breakdown. But somehow, and I like to think I know how, she realized that maybe the church could have a role in her finding peace. And what happened was that she came to our church one day and sat right at the back, like as far at the back as you can, so that people will leave you the heck alone, but you can be in the room. But this fun thing would begin to happen. Though she'd start the service at the back, whenever we'd have time for ministry, she'd come straight to the front. She would beeline. Because there was something within her that knew that this peace that she was longing for could only be found in meeting this God that she could listen to the talks, the talks were fine, but it was in this time of prayer and worship and encounter that maybe he could do something. And as she began to cry out to God to help her from the mess that she was in, she said she began to experience the deepest peace, a peace she wouldn't trade for the world. And she told me that gradually these voices in her head got quieter. She stopped wanting to talk back to them, so they stopped seeming to be as interested. Gradually, she stopped feeling paranoid, and in that place of growing trust, she trusted that maybe she could go to the NHS, and maybe they would help her, maybe they would support her, maybe they would counsel her. And today, she is restoring relationship with those who, of course, have the most pain, and who she, in turn, has inflicted pain upon. Today, she's the mum to an adorable toddler whose name means God's love and who will not have to grow up in the same cycle of fear and pain and shame and numbing oneself. You see, this girl encountered peace 
And she knows firsthand that peace has a name, and his name is Jesus. His name is Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Amen? You better give him an amen for that. <laughs> She has been transformed. She knows the value of peace because she knows what it is to have lived without it. God has come into the deep shadow places of her life and pulled her out because he loves her far too much to just watch on as she walks wounded through this world. And I think that every one of us need a peace so powerful that it can disrupt generational trauma. Every one of us need a peace that brings order out of our chaos, even when we think it's just anxiety, right? It's just worry, right? Everyone thinks like this. No. We become a people of peace by being filled with the one who is peace. So would you come close again to the God who wants to gift you peace, who sees your struggles and does not turn away, but rather runs towards you? 